let's get rid of the ballots. Ha ha. Uh, It seemed to have been meant as a joke, maybe, but uh, definitely sparking some conversation. Let's bring in Paul Grunewald. He is S&P Global Ratings Chief Economist. He's joining us from New York. Paul, we've been talking over the past several weeks about the election and how market participants are pricing it in more and more, trying to price in more and more the idea that we could have a contested election. But I'm curious for you, if you have been thinking about a potential economic effect, if there is any potential economic effect, will we have, for example, if the the election is up in the air, could it have any effect on confidence or spending? What do you think? Yeah, hi, Julie. That would be my uh, my first uh, guess at the channel. I mean, if there was uncertainty, what happens? Well, people dial back on their spending, uh, particularly on some of the more discretionary items. Maybe firms dial back on their investments. So whether it's election uncertainty or something else on the horizon that's, uh, you know, sort of clouding the picture, I think uh, the implication for us macro folks and forecasters is that uh, you get a bit potential slowdown in activity. Hey, Paul, it's Adam. Good to see you. Hey. What are we seeing right now in real time? We, we get the labor numbers on one hand, and we're going to get next week the, uh, the September job numbers. But then we see the spending situation. So we had 870,000 claims for initial unemployment. But yet it seems, although slowing a bit, that spending is holding up. And wouldn't that be good for the markets overall? Right. That's the that's the story that's emerging for Q3. Obviously, we don't have all the numbers yet in the U.S. or um, anywhere else. But uh, here in the U.S. and also, I would add, in Europe, uh, the uh, households seem to be spending. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, saving, even saving of the uh, government stimulus transfer payments here in the U.S. But that money is being spent. The labor market's a little bit better uh, than we thought it would be in this quarter. And then uh, that sort of feeds into the confidence. So we're a long way back to recovery. But in terms of growth rates, we're thinking we could get something on the order of 30% annualized in uh, Q3. Um, As I I think I argued the last time I was on your show, we should pay more attention to the levels. We're still below where we started the year, but we're potentially in in a position to put up some uh, pretty impressive looking growth numbers in the third quarter of the year. Hey, Paul, I want to ask, you know, we have this idea of uh, stimulus still not coming through, uh, the kind of back and forth uh, relationship between the Democrats and Republicans. And then now we have uh, this kind of comment uh, from President Trump about maybe not having a peaceful transfer of power. I guess overall, where does that leave uh, just sentiment on the the future of the economy, especially at a point where we're trying to see this uh, uh, recovery uh, start to really take off? Yeah, Dan, we've been saying that the the fiscal policy is key right now. So fiscal policy should try to cushion the blow keep the labor market and the SME, the small medium enterprise sector intact, and then lay the foundations for recovery. And there's a lot of uncertainty, as you noted right now, about the transfer payments, the PPP, some of the other things uh, that are going on. So the risk is that um, that policy failure or the the sort of the lack of delivery on the fiscal uh, stimulus plans to the market could potentially slow uh, the recovery. The Europeans seem to have this better than the US. We've seen Germany extend their plans into the second half of uh, 2021, and there's a lot more certainty there. But in the US, the big question is going to be Given that we have this partial recovery going and given that we've got a lot of potential you know, disruption in the labor market, is fiscal policy going to come through and, again, sort of cushion the blow and build the bridge? That's still outstanding. We'll have to see what happens there. Yeah, and that's something that Jay Powell talked a lot about in his testimony this week, right, when lawmakers came to him and said, what more can you do? And he said, well, the ball's in your court now. And yet, when you look at some of the recent economic numbers, to Adam's point about spending, there was a lot of sort of dire, were a lot of dire predictions that we would see spending fall off a cliff once those transfer payments stopped. And have you been surprised that they haven't? Do you, And so what makes you think there is still this potential for a real slowdown if we don't get another stimulus bill. Yeah, but yeah, as I said, it's it's clear that the the initial s- stimulus was partially saved, and the 600 a week was a big uh, deal. We've still got an unemployment rate of eight to nine percent, so there's a lot of stress uh, in the labor market. Um, we've had a partial recovery, as I said, but uh, you know we still have sectors that are running well below capacity. We still have parts of the labor market that are exceptionally weak. We've had people leaving the labor market. So again, you would want fiscal policy to uh, keep that all together. I agree with Paul. The Fed's done about as much as it can. 
10. Uh, policy rate's at zero. Uh, the Fed's doing some QE and it intervened in a whole bunch of markets, commercial paper, et cetera, to smooth volatility and kind of make the markets uh, more stable. And uh, we've seen financial conditions ease, but it's really, it's going to be a fiscal story. So on the policy front, the kind of make or break is going to be on the fiscal side, not the monetary side. Adam, you just need to unmute yourself. The button doesn't work. Paul, <laughs> there's trillions of dollars sitting to the side. After the election, you know, people are going to be looking to put that capital to work, not necessarily just in equities. Won't whoever wins this election get the boost of a, a massive spending and investment um, effort and that will help this economy? Yeah, well, there's there's obviously an overhang. There's money on the side. There's uncertainty about the virus, right? So I think the event that's going to unlock all of this is, uh, you know, the discovery of a, a vaccine or uh, several vaccines and then getting that to the broader population, which we think can happen, you know, by the middle of uh, next year. But you can easily imagine there's there's a lot of uh, funds waiting on the uh, on the sidelines to go in and invest. And also the economy is going to change. It's already changing, right? Away from person to person things like shopping and sports and et cetera. We're going to have more online line stuff. We're going to have more uh, health security. We're going to have less commercial real estate. So all of that restructuring needs to take place as well. But the big overhang here is the uncertainty around the uh, the path of the virus and when we get a vaccine. Um, things seem to be a little bit more optimistic than the last time uh, we published and the last time we talked with you guys. Uh, that's probably a modest upside risk for us. But when we get clarity on that, sooner rather than uh, later, all of us hope, that's going to unlock a lot of money and, uh, you know, hopefully really give a, 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 a sort of a rocket boost to the recovery. Paul Grunwald, S&P Global Ratings Chief Economist. Always good to get some time with you, Paul. Thank you. Good to see you guys as well. Take care.